Hello, my name is Steve Miller and I'm the Technical Marketing Manager for the Physical Modeling Products at the MathWorks. In this presentation we're going to see how you can model and simulate hybrid electric vehicles in the MATLAB and Simulink environment. Here are the key points that I want to make sure you take away from this presentation. First we're going to see that physical component models at various levels of fidelity are necessary for HEV development. At times in the development process we'll need to iterate quickly, so we'll need models that have less detail but simulate fast. For example, using lookup tables to represent the torque current relationship in motors and generators. At other times, we'll want to simulate the entire three phase electrical network. So at that point, we'll use more detailed models and include switching dynamics. The ability to balance the trade off between model fidelity and simulation speed is critical for efficient development. Next, we'll see that modeling the plant and controller in a single environment enables system level optimization. The model that we're working with consists of the physical system and the control system in a single environment. Because of this, we'll be able to optimize system level performance, and we'll see a demonstration of how parallel computing can accelerate this process. Finally, integration with MATLAB and Simulink enables efficient development, post-processing, and deployment. We'll see how we can automatically document the results of our tests, and we'll see how we can generate C code from the model for deployment onto a hardware in the loop system. Here is the agenda for our presentation. First, we'll have an overview of the hybrid electric vehicle model. We'll then move on to the modeling aspects of the system, including the electrical system, mechanical, thermal, and control system. We'll then move on to simulation and post-processing. We'll see demonstrations on using parallel computing, automatically documenting simulation results, and investigating power quality. Finally, we'll generate C code from our model and run it in real time on a hardware in the loop system. The model that we're working with has many options for balancing model fidelity and simulation speed. The electrical model has a system level variant which we can use to test for integration issues and to optimize the, the entire system. We also have a mean value variant where we can perform tests on a three phase electrical system. And finally we have a detailed variant which includes the power electronics so that we can test the power quality on the different net electrical networks in our hybrid electric vehicle. For the battery model, we have the option of using generic, predefined, and custom models, depending on which portion of the system we're focusing on. And finally, the vehicle model has two different variants, one that includes simply inertial and aerodynamic effects that simulates very quickly, and then we have another variant that includes tire models and other dynamics. These options to adjust the level of model fidelity makes us quite flexible in the development process and enables us to develop, to develop efficiently. We'll also see that the simulation results match at the system level. This enables us to use the lower fidelity models to iterate more quickly. When looking at the electrical system, we'll see that adding the detail to the model will give us the option of doing a much more detailed analysis of the electrical system. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see how this is done. Here's the model that we'll be working with. It's a hybrid electric vehicle with a series parallel architecture. It consists of a control system with multiple proportional integral controllers as well as mode logic programmed in state flow. We also have the mechanical system which consists of the engine, the power split device, and the vehicle dynamics modeled in sim driveline. The electrical system has a motor, generator, DC-DC converter, and a battery. We can switch between the different variants using configurable subsystems. So here is where we would select the different battery models and you can see at the electrical level we have the three different variants that we described before system level, mean value, and detailed as well as for the vehicle dynamics, the full and the simple models. To test this model we're going to use a MATLAB script. We're going to run it through three different drive cycles and view the results. You can see here that we're testing this at the system level with the simple vehicle and the predefined battery and the drive cycles that we're testing are shown here. We downloaded these drive cycles from the internet and these are standard drive cycles that are used to test hybrid electric vehicles. When all three tests are complete, we'll see a report that shows the results comparing the system level results with more detailed results simulated using the other variants of this model. You can see that the simulations are running quite quickly. This is a 400 second simulation and they're running in about 10, in about 10 seconds. So you can see we're being a, we would be able to iterate very quickly with this variant of the system. This is the report that I mentioned. You can see it was generated automatically using the Simulink report generator. If we scroll down you can see screenshots from the model, the state flow, 
you can see a plot of the vehicle speed from the scope and then here are the plots that compare it with the results from the other variants of our of our model using this the mean value and the detailed models and you can see that for the electrical system for the speeds of the vehicles and the motors that the results compare quite well so we can see that using this model we are easily we can easily vary the levels of model fidelity and the results match very well so that we can also do more detailed analyses Now that we've seen an overview of the hybrid electric vehicle model, we'll move on to the modeling aspects of the system, looking at the electrical, mechanical, thermal, and control systems. First, we'll look at battery models. Sim Electronics provides a generic battery model. It's represented as a charge-dependent voltage source. The advantage of this battery model is that it can be used to represent many different types of batteries, and there are relatively few parameters that can be easily found on data sheets. Sim Power Systems provides many predefined battery models. You can select them from a pull down menu and they have full parameterization. The documentation provides extensive detail on how these batteries are modeled. Let's see how these blocks are used in our system model. So here you can see the generic battery model in Sim Electronics. We have parameterized this model with MATLAB variables and here you can see the equation that represents the charge coming from this battery. We can switch this using configurable subsystems to look at the predefined model. If I go in here, I can see the Sim Power Systems block, and here I can select from different chemistries. If I want to see how this battery is modeled, I can look in the documentation, and here you'll see extensive documentation on the equations that were used and any assumptions that have been made. If these battery models don't meet your needs, you can create a custom battery model using the Simscape language. A common way to create a battery model is to create a battery cell equivalent discharge circuit. You can see an example of one here. Many of the components in this circuit will be dependent upon state of charge, depth of charge, and temperature. You can create these custom components using the Simscape language and then build up the model of the battery cell. The battery cell with this equivalent discharge circuit would look like this. We've created a thermal model using the foundation library in Simscape so that we can vary properties of the cell using temperature. The components themselves were created using the Simscape language. And here's where we can create nonlinear or exponential relationships between voltage and current. Now we'll switch over to the model to see how this was incorporated. Using configurable subsystems, I'm going to select the cells model. Here you can see we've created our battery consisting of 10 battery cells. And each battery cell has the equivalent discharge circuit shown to you on the slide. The thermal model was created using Simscape. You can see that we have the battery thermal mass, a heat flow source, and we're measuring temperature in order to calculate property values that are dependent upon temperature. The components themselves were created using the Simscape language. Here you can see the parameters for this particular component, and if we click on this link, you can see the source code for the Simscape language. You can see that we, ident we create physical nodes, variables, outputs, we define the parameters, and all of these have units, and then further down we define the relationship for this component. You can see that we have voltage is related to current using according to this formula. This equals equals sign means that this is an implicit relationship, so we're defining an implicit relationship between the variables, parameters, and their derivatives. This is not assignment, this is an implicit equation, and that's different than what you would normally do in MATLAB or C or other input-output methods. For more information on the Simscape language, it's based on MATLAB and enables text-based authoring of physical modeling components, domains, and libraries. Here you can see the source code for an ultracapacitor, another uh, element that you might find in a hybrid electric vehicle. The equations that you might find in a textbook can be implemented in the equation section, again according to that implicit uh, de definition that I explained before. The key things to remember is that it leverages MATLAB, so if you're familiar with MATLAB, you'll be able to adopt this physical modeling language very quickly. It's object-oriented for model reuse. You can use it to generate Simulink blocks like the ones we saw in the model, and if you need to, you can save this model as a binary file in order to protect your intellectual property. Using these capabilities, you can build up a custom battery model to meet your needs. Let's look at the rest of our electrical system. 
For the system level variant, the motor and generator were modeled using Simelectronics. In Simelectronics, the motors and drivers use datasheet parameters so that you can find those values easily. And they include torque, independent, dependent, and electrical losses. For power quality analysis, we incorporated three phase machine models from SimPower Systems. These include a more detailed parameterization. A key capability of SimPower Systems to speed up simulations with power electronics is the ideal switching algorithm. When the ideal switching algorithm is used, SimPower Systems looks at our electrical circuit, identifies the power electronics, and computes the different configurations that can result when the switches are open and closed. These are then translated into a state space matrix. By treating the switches as ideal and pre-computing these configurations, the simulations run much faster. Let's see how these components were used in our overall model. Here is our electrical network. A DC-DC converter is used to boost the voltage from the battery to the 500 volts required on our DC network. That is used to drive the motor. The motor in the system level variant of our electrical network is modeled using SIM electronics. You can see that a lookup table has been used to specify the relationship between speed and torque. This enables this motor model to run extremely quickly and these are parameter values you should be able to find on a datasheet. Other parameter values available here allow us to model the torque independent and dependent losses and we have parameterized these parameters using MATLAB variables. If we look at this network we can see that we have electrical connections on this side and mechanical connections on this side. This allows us to connect to the rest of the mechanical drivetrain in our, net, in our hybrid electric vehicle. Creating this all-in-one environment allows us to check for integration issues between the mechanical drivetrain, the electrical network, and the control system. The generator follows a similar, similar structure, again modeled from SIM electronics with a connection to the electrical bus and the mechanical drivetrain. The DC-DC converter was modeled using Simscape. We have modeled this by setting the power from the battery equal to the power transmitted to the bus um, plus the power lost to load dependent losses. And the current through our load dependent losses is what we use to calculate the temperature of our DC-DC converter. This was modeled using the foundation library in Simscape. The temperature of our DC-DC converter is fed back to our controller to affect the mode logic of our system. Now let's see how the detailed network looks, or the detailed variant looks for our electrical system. Here you can see that the structure is identical. We have the DC-DC converter, motor, and generator. However, the DC-DC converter contains power electronics to model the power electronic switching as we boost the voltage from the battery to the DC bus. Here you can see where we are calculating the pulse width modulated signal based on the voltage. If we go to the synchronous motor model, we can see that we have a three-phase electrical motor from SimPower Systems and a three-phase inverter to convert this DC, net uh, DC electrical network to our AC electrical network here. And we have a vector controller that is used to specify the pulse width modulation to the three-phase inverter. Here we have the connection to our mechanical network. The generator has a similar structure. You can see that we have far more detail in this model than in the system level variant. We have the three phases of the electrical network and we have power electronics in the motor, the generator, and the DC-DC converter. Because of this additional detail, we'll need to take a far smaller step size when simulating this model. Because of this, to complete this 400 second simulation will take many hours. This is where it's important to have the ability to switch back and forth between a system level variant where we can iterate quickly, in a, where we completed this 400 second simulation in a matter of 10 seconds, to the detailed variant where we can do tests like analyze po the power quality on the DC network. Having the ability to switch back and forth allows us to do the detailed analysis while iterating quickly in other phases of development. Let's see how the mechanical drivetrain is modeled. The power split device is modeled as a planetary gear using the gear libraries in Sim Driveline. Here you can see some of the gear models that are available. The full vehicle model includes tire models and longitudinal dynamics. The tire model includes transient and steady state dynamics and the longitudinal dynamics are included for those are relevant for fuel economy studies. The engine model is a lookup table relating speed to available power. If these models are not sufficient for your needs, you can extend them using the Simscape language or using Simulink. Let's switch over to the model to see how these are incorporated. 
So the engine model is here. We can see that the input is a throttle signal coming from our controller. Mechanical connections connect it to the remainder of the drivetrain. The planetary gear is modeled using SIM driveline. Here we can see the carrier, which is connected to the engine, the ring, which is connected to the vehicle and the electrical motor, and the sun, which is connected to the, the generator. These mechanical connections connect to the rest of the system. I'm going to switch to the full vehicle model so we can see how this was modeled. Here you can see the tire model, the vehicle dynamics, and the differential for connecting these two axles. So this represents the front axle and this re represents the rear axle. To find out more information about what effects are captured in these models, you can look at the documentation where we've documented the different parameters, the different uh, equations that were used, and also references at the bottom. This information is available on the internet if you wish to see more about what our, dry, our entire model incorporates. But here you can see that we have our connection to the rest of our system and we were able to switch very quickly between this more detailed model that has tires and with, that has tire models and other components with the more simpler model that we used at the system level. Let's look at a simple example of the specification for the mode logic of a hybrid electric vehicle. When the vehicle is in motion, it may be in start mode. In start mode, the generator is used as a starter motor to start the engine, and the electrical motor is used to drive the vehicle. When the engine gets above a certain threshold, the vehicle enters normal mode, where the engine is used to drive the vehicle and to charge the battery. If the driver wishes to accelerate, the motor can be used to drive the vehicle even faster, and the generator is turned off so that all of the engine's torque can be used to accelerate the vehicle. When the vehicle is in cruise mode, the generator may be used to charge the battery. There are also transitions to go back to acceleration mode and to start mode. If the driver applies the brakes, then the motor is used via regenerative braking to charge the battery. So this is an example of the specification for the mode logic. To implement this in the MATLAB and Simulink environment, we would use state flow, and the resulting model would look like this. As you can see, it looks almost exactly like the specification, where we can see the different states, the actions taken in those states, and when to transition. What's important is that production code can be generated directly from this model, so that means that the same model that you have used for desktop simulation can then be used to generate your production code automatically. Let's see how this mo model is integrated into our overall HEV model. The mode logic for our HEV is contained in the control subsystem. We can see that it takes the vehicle speed, brake input, battery charge, and engine speed as inputs, figures out the state of the vehicle, and either enables or disables the motor, the generator, or the engine. Double clicking on the mode block shows us the state machine programmed in state flow, where we can see the states, the transitions, and the different actions taken in each state. This state flow chart is animated during simulation so that you can use it as a debugging tool. You can see during which parts of the drive cycle which state we're in and which actions are being taken. To give you an impression of how that works, I'm going to rerun the simulation for the first drive cycle. We'll see during the first period of acceleration that the engine doesn't come on. In the subsequent periods of acceleration, the engine does come on and we can see that the generator is used to charge the battery. I'll open up the state flow model and run the simulation. The blue state is the one that we're in. You can see that in the second period of acceleration, the generator is used, as in the third state of, of acceleration. So here you've seen an example of how mode logic can be incorporated into our Simulink model. We can use it as a debugging tool to determine whether or not the HEV is transitioning to the proper state. And remember, this chart can be converted to production code, enabling you to use model-based design on your control system. Now that we've seen how to model the HEV, we'll move on to simulation and post-processing tasks, including parallel computing, report generation, and power quality analysis. In Simulink, you can use optimization algorithms to automatically tune parameter values. For example, you can use them to match a response. If you have measurement data for the torque of your motor, you can use optimization algorithms to tune the parameters of your motor model until the simulation results match that measurement data. You can also use it to meet requirements. 
If you know the boundaries for the step response of your motor, you can specify the boundaries of that step response and then use optimization algorithms to tune the parameter values until the response lies within those boundaries. This is a particularly powerful capability when applied to the complete system, and this is very important for hybrid electric vehicles. In our model, for example, we have parameters for the control system as well as the physical system. We can set up an optimization that tests 100 different drive cycles and calculates the cost. Feeding that information to an optimization algorithm will allow us to find an optimal set of parameters that optimizes system performance. This is better than optimizing the individual components for it will, allow, it will lead to better results. As you can see, developing a hybrid electric vehicle will involve a lot of simulations. An important capability to have in order to accelerate your development process is the ability to distribute those simulations to, your, to different cores or computers. In Simulink, it is possible to distribute your simulations to multiple cores or processors. This can result in a dramatic speed up for simulations, for example, doing parameter sweeps, drive cycles, optimizations, and other types of tests. You can take your model, set up the simulations, and then distribute them to different cores on a single machine, or you can distribute them to multiple machines in a computer cluster. And doing this can be as simple as changing your MATLAB script from a for loop to a par for loop. We're going to show you a demonstration of how to do this now. In this demonstration, we're going to show how to shorten simulation times with parallel computing. Here is the model that we're working with. It's a hybrid electric vehicle with a series parallel architecture. We want to run a parameter sweep on parameters in the model. However, we want to minimize the amount of time it takes to run this parameter sweep. To do this, we're going to use the Parallel Computing Toolbox to speed up the sweep. We're going to generate a set of parameters for each of the simulation runs. We're then going to distribute those simulation runs to both cores on my dual core machine. At the end of the simulation, we'll be able to plot those results, and we'll see that when executed in parallel, it takes less time. Here are the steps that we're going to go through to compare those simulation methods. First, we're going to open a pool of MATLAB sessions on my computer. Since I have a dual core machine, we'll open up two sessions. We're then going to generate the parameter sets that we'll need for the simulations. We're going to vary the weight of the vehicle in our model. Next, we're going to run the simulation serially. We'll use a for loop to run the simulations and see how long it takes. We'll also look at the Windows Task Manager to see the amount of activity on our cores. Then we'll run the simulations in parallel, again looking at the Task Manager. We'll see that when executed in parallel that the sweep takes about half the time and we'll see that both cores are used to their maximum. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see how this is done. Here is the model that we're working with. We have our hybrid electric vehicle. The parameter that we're going to vary is the vehicle mass, and you can see we've parameterized it with a MATLAB variable here. Using this script, we're going to execute the steps to test these, to test the, run this parameter sweep in parallel. First, we're going to generate the set of parameters for each of the tests, varying the mass of the vehicle. Next, we're going to open up the MATLAB pool. So on my dual core machine, I'm going to open up two MATLAB sessions. During the sweep of the, during, as we run the parameter sweep, we're going to distribute the set of simulations to both of those MATLAB sessions, one on each core. We'll then be able to see how this is, this speeds up the simulation. Once the MATLAB session is open, I'm going to run the simulations in series. You'll see that I've set up a for loop to run the simulations as we loop over the weight of the vehicle. We'll run that, that set of simulations first in series. As we run the simulation, we're going to see how that uh, shows up on the cores. So first, I'm going to kick off this parameter sweep, again, running serially using the for, the for command. We can see on the task manager that the cores are used, but not to their full potential. So we can see that most of the work is being, the simulation work is being done on one core, and the remainder of the tasks are taking, being taking place on the other core. At the end of this serial loop of simulations, we'll see how long it took to run. Again, we're running a series of 11 simulations. Each simulation is about 200 seconds of simulation time long. So you can see that, uh, that this will take, obviously, a lot less than 11 times 200 seconds. So the simulation is complete, and we can see that it took 40 seconds to complete that parameter sweep. 
Now I'm simply going to change the MATLAB code to use the command par4. This is the command that will execute the parameter sweep in parallel. So the simulations are now being distributed to both cores of my dual core machine. We can see that reflected in the window task manager as my cores are now being used all the way up to 100%. So the same set of 11 simulations is being run and at the end we'll see how long it took to run that parameter sweep. So the sweep is finished and we can see that it took about half the time. There's some overhead involved in setting up the parameter sweep but we can see that distributing the simulations to both cores shortened this parameter sweep time dramatically. I'll now plot the simulation results so that you can see that we did in fact run the 11 different simulations. And by varying the weight of the vehicle, we can see that it required more torque from the motor. So we've seen that using parallel computing with Simulink, it's very easy to set up the, the, the parameter sweep to distribute the simulations to both cores, and this will dramatically speed up um, tests that involve lots of simulations, including parameter sweeps, optimizations, and so on. In this demonstration, we're going to show how to automatically run tests and document results. When developing a system as complicated as a hybrid electric vehicle, much iteration is required. An engineer comes up with a design change, configures a set of tests to test that change, runs them, collects the results, and then based on that comes up with a new idea for a design change. In this cycle of iteration, these steps take the longest and are the most prone to error. So what we want to do is to find a way to make creating and evaluating those text results go faster so that we can speed up the process of iteration. To do this, we're going to use the Simulink report generator to automatically set up the tests, run them, and document the results. We're going to take a hybrid electric vehicle model and configure the simulations. Using the Simulink report generator, we're going to include plots and results, screenshots, and MATLAB code into a document. This will all be done automatically. I'll now switch over to an example of the report so you can see what that looks like. Here is an example of a report produced by the Simulink report generator. You can see that there's a table of contents, list of figures, and then further down we can see that there is MATLAB code, screenshots of the model itself, of the mode logic from Stateflow, scopes, and plots generated in MATLAB. And this entire document was generated automatically from a script that was set up to run through a set of drive cycles. I'll now show you how we can set up that test. Here's the model that we're working with, the hybrid electric vehicle model in series parallel configuration. If we go to the Simulink report generator, we see the report explorer. In the report explorer, this is where we set up the test. So you can see that we have configured a, a set of tests and the way that we're going to capture or document the results of those tests. We have a for loop set up to loop through configurations. For this simple test, we're simply going to use one single configuration. We set up another loop to capture screenshots of the model and of the scopes, and then we have another loop set up to cycle through the drive cycles. Once we To set up this report, you simply drag the elements from this column where the template elements are set up into the report generator and put them in the right order. To run the, the report generator, you simply press this button. So now we'll see that the Simulink report generator set up the tests, run them, and document the results. We can see that it has already set up the, sim the first drive cycle. The drive cycle is indicated here, and we can see the results of that drive cycle on the scope. At the conclusion of the test, it uses MATLAB code to generate plots, and then configures the next drive cycle. So now we're on drive cycle two. The plots that are being produced compare the simulation results with more complicated variants of this design. So this would be a way to, ra to rapidly and automatically configure the plots that you want to use to evaluate your di design change. The Simulink report generator is now on the third drive cycle. And at the conclusion of this drive cycle, the Simulink report generator will assemble the required elements into the report and show it to us. So now the report has been generated, and again it has the same structure as I showed you before where we see the screenshots of the model, uh, the, state, the mode logic, shots of the, the screenshots of the scopes, the plots, and so on. So you can see that it was not, once we've set up this report, it's very easy to 
run a set of tests to evaluate a design change and document those results in a report so that we remember why we chose to accept or deny a certain design change. Using the Simulink report generator, this process of iteration goes much faster and makes your development process more efficient. The tests that we've run to this point use the system level model for rapid iteration. Now we're going to see an example where we're going to use a more detailed model to perform power quality analysis. In this demonstration, we're going to use simulation to investigate the power quality of the electrical network in a hybrid electric vehicle. Here's the model that we're working with. It's a hybrid electric vehicle with a series parallel architecture. We have a DC electrical network connecting the battery to AC motor and generator. If we plot the voltage of the DC electrical network, this is what it looks like. We can see that the power quality of the DC network is poor during the start and end of this 10 second drive cycle. We want to make sure that the power quality of the DC electrical network is as high as possible, for poor power quality can result in malfunctions, faults, overheated components, and premature failure. So we're going to use simulation to investigate the power quality of the DC bus. To do this, we're going to use SimPower systems to model the electrical network and then Signal Processing Toolbox to analyze the power quality. Our electrical network is modeled using SimPower systems. We have the generator and the motor that are both connected to the DC bus with power electronics in the three-phase inverter. Using spectrogram from the Signal Processing Toolbox, we can create a spectrogram of the DC bus. This gives us an indication of the power quality from the DC bus and can be used to figure out which components are contributing to poor quality on the bus. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see how this is done. Here is the model that we're working with, the hybrid electric vehicle with series parallel architecture. If I go into the electrical network we can see that the battery is connected to the electrical network via a DC-DC converter which has power electronics inside it to boost the voltage of the battery to the higher voltage required by the DC bus. The synchronous motor and drive are modeled using SimPower systems. You can see that a three-phase inverter is used to connect the DC network to the AC network required by the machine. The generator has the same structure where, again, power electronics are used to connect the AC network of the permanent magnet synchronous machine to the DC bus. The test that we have run is a short simulation where the vehicle accelerates from rest, stays at a, at a single speed, and then slows down using regenerative braking. This short test exposes the electrical system to a series of different conditions and can be used to check the power quality. This simulation with all the power electronics can take a long time to run for we have to take very small time steps. So instead of running the simulation, I'm going to use MATLAB commands to load the data into the MATLAB workspace and create the plots. First, I'll load the data into the workspace and plot the voltage that you saw on the slide. So you can see that there's a lot more dynamics on the network in the early and later phases. Using spectrogram from the signal processing toolbox, I can create a Fourier, uh, an FFT in time during the of course of the entire simulation. So I'll execute those commands and you can see that we have time on the x-axis and frequency on the vertical axis. So each line here corresponds to an FFT. The colors indicate the the contribution from frequencies at that from those frequencies and you can see that the power quality is poor at the start and the end of simulation another way of viewing this is in three dimensions so you can see the colors indicate uh, the contribution at that frequency and if we press on the 3d button we can rotate it and this gives us another view that indicates what the power quality is like during the simulation so using this we can try and figure out which components are contributing to the power quality this line at roughly 800 hertz corresponds to the frequency of the sawtooth used to generate the PWM on the DC-DC converter. And we can see some more inf uh, frequency content here. And further analysis could point to the different components that are, that are contributing to this. I'll now show you a more dramatic example where it's very clear which components are contributing to poor power quality. I'll close these plots, load a new set of data, and bring up another spectrogram. Here we can see lines corresponding to very high frequency content and those lines are very clear in, uh, in the range that they're in. If I plot the generator speed, you'll see that those lines correspond very closely to the speed of the generator. So this indicates that the generator is contributing to the poor power quality during this particular test. If I plot the motor speed, you'll also see 
that there are lines corresponding to the motor speed as well. So we need to make adjustments to both, the, both of these components and perhaps their inverters in order to make sure there is less leakage from the AC network onto the DC network. In this demonstration we've seen how we can model the electrical system using SimPower systems to include the three phase and the power electronics components and then use spectrogram from the signal processing toolbox to get an indication as to which components are contributing to poor power quality. We'll now see how the same model we've used for simulation on the desktop can be converted to C code for deployment for, to hardware in the loop systems and other environments. To use our hybrid electric vehicle model for hardware in the loop testing, it will need to simulate in real time. That means simulating with a fixed step solver. Using Simscape local solvers improves simulation performance for fixed step simulation. In Simscape, you have the option of using fixed step implicit solvers locally on physical networks. This means using implicit solvers only where it's necessary. To this point, we've been simulating our system with a variable step solver. Now we need to simulate with a fixed step solver. In Simscape, you have the option of using implicit solvers locally on the physical networks. Implicit solvers are more accurate, but tend to require more calculations. With Simscape, you can use the implicit solvers on the physical network, and then a different explicit solver on the global network. This reduces the number of calculations done per time step, making your model more likely to run in real time. In Simscape, you can configure a, lo a local solver per physical network. This enables you to run different physical networks at different sample rates, so electrical networks at higher rates and mechanical at lower rates again reducing the number of calculations done per time step. The primary benefit of this is to speed up simulations where fixed step solvers are required like hardware in the loop testing. Now we'll have an example a demonstration that shows how this is done. In this demonstration we're going to see how we can configure a hybrid electric vehicle for hardware in the loop testing. The model that we're working with is a hybrid electric vehicle with a parallel series architecture. We have a battery connected to a motor and a generator we have a mechanical system, and as well we have the control system. We've been using this model to develop both the physical model as well as the controller. We're now ready to test the controller and we wish to do it without a hardware prototype. So we need to configure this model that we've been using for desktop simulation so that it can be used for hardware in the loop testing. To do this we're going to use Simscape local solvers and other settings to make the model real-time capable. We're going to take our model, configure it for real-time simulation, generate code, and then run it on real-time hardware. You'll see when we're finished doing that, that the results of the simulation on the real-time target match the, re the simulation results obtained on the desktop. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see how this is done. Here's the model that we're working with. The control system consists of multiple PI controllers and a state machine programmed in state flow. The physical system consists of the mechanical system and the electrical system. You can see the engine, the power split device or planetary gear, the vehicle dynamics, and in the electrical system we have a motor, generator, DC-DC converter, and a battery. For our, to obtain a set of reference results, we're going to run the simulation with the variable step solver ODE15S. These are going to be the accurate reference results that we'll use to make sure that our fixed step simulation results are accurate. You can see that with the variable step solver, the simulation of 195 seconds finishes very quickly. In order to make the comparison with the fixed step solver results, we're going to save the data to MATLAB variables in the workspace and then create a plot. We'll compare our fixed step results to the variable step results here. Now we need to configure the simulation for fixed step simulation. We'll need to enable the local solvers for Simscape in the solver configuration block. We'll enable the local solver, and where we have selected a sample time, and we'll enable fixed cost simulation, which bounds the number of calculations per time step to make sure that the model is real-time capable. We're also going to need to adjust the global simulation solver. So I'll go to configuration panel, to the solver panel, and select the fixed step solver ODE1. I'll leave the fixed step size to auto and that will be controlled by the step size in the simulation. At this point we can now run, rerun the simulation to generate the fixed step simulation results. Once we have this set of results we'll need to compare it to the variable step simulation results to ensure that the results are accurate. 
The different settings that we've chosen for the solver and for the step size can affect the accuracy. So we'll need to make sure that the settings that we have generate accurate results and then we'll also need to be sure that, they, that this will permit fast enough execution on the real-time system. So we can see that we're about halfway through the simulation run now and we're still running considerably faster than real-time on my machine. This will likely be fast enough to run on the real-time target. Here on the right hand side, the left hand side, you can see the commands that we'll use to save the data to the MATLAB workspace to make the comparison. So the simulation is now complete. We need to compare these results to the variable step results. We'll execute this MATLAB code to save the data to the MATLAB workspace and then add this data to the plot. And we can see that the variable step reference results match the fixed step results very well. Even if I zoom in very closely, you can see that the fixed step results match very closely to the variable step results. So our simulation settings produce accurate results. Now we need to convert this to C code and download it to the real-time system to see that it executes in real-time. In order to make sure that the simulation, to shorten the simulation, I'm going to set the simulation time to 30. We'll then build C code and you can see in the command window the messages that are generated as the C code is generated. I'll also show you the real-time system that we'll be working with. You can see a, here a monitor and this is where the results of the sim real-time simulation will be shown. It is sitting on top of a real-time target. This real-time target is where the, the real-time simulation will be run and it's connected to my laptop using uh, this cable so you can see that we'll be able to download the code to this, to this real-time target, view the results on this monitor, and then upload the results to put them on the plot and compare them with the other simulation results that we have. So the generation of C code is almost complete and again we're generating code for the control system as well as the physical systems that you've seen, the electrical and mechanical systems. So you can see that the monitor has changed, the code has been generated and downloaded to the real-time target. We're going to set this up to run in external mode so that you can also see the results from the simulation on this scope. We'll connect to the real-time target and then run the simulation. You'll be able to see the simulation results both on the monitor as well as on this scope here. You can see the time offset here in the lower corner. So after about 10 seconds the vehicle begins to accelerate just as it did in the previous two simulations. It holds at a constant speed for a brief period of time and then slows down using regenerative braking through until 30 seconds. So the simulation is complete. We didn't have any overruns, so the model is capable of running in real time. At this point, we're going to upload the data from the real time target and plot it on the same figure where we have the previous two sets of results. And you can see that the simulation results in the, with the generated code are very accurate. It matches the, the fixed step simulation we did on our machine, which is very close to the reference set of results we've obtained with the variable step solver. So we have seen that we are able to use the same model that we were using for desktop simulation for real-time simulation. This will enable us to test the controller without having a hardware prototype of the vehicle. In the previous demonstration, we've seen how the hybrid electric vehicle model can be converted to C code, and we used it to run in real-time on a hardware in the loop system. There are other uses for the C code that we've generated. It can be converted into a standalone executable, which can be used to perform sets of simulation, for example, parameter sweeps. You can also integrate the C code into other simulation environments. This increases the efficiency of other teams in your engineering organization, for they don't have to rebuild this model, they can simply use the model that you have created. To summarize what we've seen in this presentation, we've seen that physical component models at various levels of fidelity are necessary for HEV development. 
There will be times when you need to iterate quickly, and then there will be times when you need more detail to isolate a certain problem. We've also seen that modeling the plant and controller in a signal environment enables system level optimization. We are able to adjust, automatically adjust parameters on both the control and physical system in order to optimize system level performance. Parallel computing can speed up this process. And finally, integration with MATLAB and Simulink enables efficient development, post-processing, and deployment. We'll now have a brief pause while we collect your questions. We'll be back in a moment to answer them.